today. Whoa, whoa, guys, whoa, whoa. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. I have never seen anything like that in my life. One of the worst wrecks in NASCAR history. To walk away from that accident with, with no broken bones is, is completely miraculous. See why this walking miracle is still racing. That's next on Canadian Edition. Well, hello and welcome to Canadian Edition. I'm David Gartz, and thank you for joining us for today's program. We're in uh, toward the end of May here, and we're in this period between Easter, the Resurrection Sunday, and Pentecost Sunday, which happens this year on June 12th. And so we're in a kind of a waiting period, much like the disciples were. Jesus said to them, wait, tarry is how the King James says it, tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And one of the things we believe in terms of the 700 Club Ministries is that it's not by might, it's not by our power, not by our energy or creativity, but as Zechariah said, it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And today, as you watch the program, you're going to see the power of God revealed in miraculous ways. But we also want you to know that that same power of the Holy Spirit, that spirit that came in full power on the day of Pentecost, is still available to you. It's available if you'll just trust by faith that God loves you and that he has a plan for your life that he wants to touch you and intervene. And if you'd like to experience that power and presence of the Holy Spirit to embrace the love of God for you, we'll have phone numbers that will be on your screen throughout the program. Toll free, it's 877-431-7887. And the greater Toronto area, 416-431-0700. There's power today, not human power, not ours, but that of the Holy Spirit. Call us and let us appropriate that power over what God has planned for you. Well, Michael McDowell makes his living driving the NASCAR Speedway. Every time he gets behind the wheel, he takes his life in his hands. But three years ago, his worst fear became his defining moment. Take a look. Michael McDowell, only his second NASCAR Sprint Cup Series last November, started 17th, finished 20th. He was actually 29th quickest. Whoa, whoa, guys, whoa, whoa, oh, no, oh, my gosh. I have never seen anything like that in my life. It was one of the worst wrecks in the history of NASCAR. And yet, Michael McDowell miraculously walked away. You know, just kind of checking my body, and I was like, well, I feel all right. And I just hopped out and didn't have any broken bones, didn't have any... Um, you know, any really side effects from the accident. And people look at that wreck and they're like, wow, look at the safety of the car. Look how much um, has been done in, in just a short period of time from when Dale Earnhardt Sr. died. But I also know that just like my career, God had that opportunity. He could either right then and there have been, okay, this is your last day here racing. This is your last day here on earth, or I'm gonna just make this thing miraculous. And that's what he did is to walk away from that accident with with no broken bones is, is completely miraculous. and. Um, so I know that, that God's hand was on that. Since 2008, Michael McDowell has made a name for himself as one of NASCAR's top young drivers. As a rookie in the Nationwide Series, he scored five top 10 finishes and 18 top 20 finishes. Michael's journey to life behind the steering wheel began when he was 10 years old. We went go-kart racing in Phoenix, and um, that's really where I got the bug to really want to be you know, a race car driver long term you know i remember being 10 years old thinking okay this is what i'm going to do for the rest of my life michael dove into competitive go-kart racing and quickly became a standout but despite his success he recalls feeling that something was missing when he was a teenager his girlfriend invited him to church i just heard the pastor speak about forgiveness and about starting a new life and starting a new day and i was like man that kind of sounds good i don't know how to do that but it sounds good and he talked about not being able to earn it that there was nothing you could do to earn God's grace, that it's a free gift, and all you have to do is accept it. And I was just thinking to myself, man, that would be awesome just to start a new day, a new life, just have your, your slate wiped clean. And, and God just really took a hold of me from that day forward. In 2004, Michael married his high school sweetheart, and together, he and Jamie were ready for Michael's career to reach new heights. I was actually um, racing in the Star Mazda series, which is open wheel cars, and I was having a lot of success. Um, I won the championship, um, won eight out of ten races, and you know things were just going great, and my career was skyrocketing. And 
um, it continued to do that for the next couple of years, constantly winning races and sort of being that lead guy or in that lead role. But when Michael debuted on the NASCAR circuit in 2007, it was a different story. When I got the NASCAR, it's, it was an extremely humbling experience because everybody at this level is champions and race winners. And so you're entering this field of the greatest drivers there are. And so you being good isn't necessarily meaning that you're going to be the best in this sport. Michael changed teams a few times until he landed with Whitney Motorsports. And it didn't quite turn out the way he expected because he failed to qualify for five races. And I go with this, this new team and I end up missing five races in a row. And in my career, I've only missed seven races. Five of those I missed in a row after I felt God calling me to this other race team. And I'm like, okay, like, I know I didn't miss the boat. I know that I felt your tug. I know that you're leading me here. So what, what's going on, you know? And I'll never forget this moment. My wife and I were driving in the car. We had our son with us and um, I got a phone call. It was from the cup team that I was driving for, Whitney Motorsports. And um, they said, we're not gonna need you anymore. You know, we don't need your services anymore. You know, it just didn't work out. And I was like, oh, that's kind of funny. I started laughing because like God said he's going to provide and I get fired, you know. <laughs> and I told my wife, I said, you never believe it. I just got fired. And uh, she's like, what? And I said, I remember thinking this and I, and I went to say it is that if my ability is not enough and I stopped myself right there mm -hmm. and I said, my ability is from God. It's enough. Has to be enough. Mm -hmm. My ability has to be enough. When Michael got home that night, he got a call he didn't expect from Joe Gibbs Racing. Now, to give you background, Joe Gibbs Racing, if you're going to be a driver in NASCAR, it's one of the top three places you want to be. If you're a Christian driver in NASCAR, it is the only place you want to be. And said, hey, we got an opportunity. We were wondering if you'd be interested in driving the 18 car in the Nationwide Series when Kyle Busch is not. And if you're going to drive any car in the Nationwide Series, the 18 car has won more races in the last two years than any other car out there. Like, it doesn't get any better than this, right? <laughs> and so I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And I was just like, I was just blown away, you know, because not because of that phone call, but because God like said, I'll take care of it. Today, Michael is driving for HP Racing in the Sprint Cup Series and will debut with Joe Gibbs Racing in the Nationwide Series later this season. It's been three years since his accident, and he says it's because of his crash that he has a stage to share the love of Christ. Just through that accident, people might not know who Michael McDowell is from race wins and from championships and I hope someday that they do because that's obviously you know what drives us in racing is to to win races but I also know that God has a bigger plan it's it's not just about my own personal success but um, you know how we think and, and how we grow the kingdom for him and bring glory to him whether I go out there and win 15 races this year or I go up and fall flat on my face it doesn't matter like it's still the same God that provided that opportunity you know it's just an unbelievable feeling and just to know that like God cares enough about me personally that personal relationship with Christ that he would say look what I could do and look what I can do and um, you know it's just amazing well, I know we've got a lot of Canadians that are interested in racing Cascar is something that we've been familiar with obviously for many years in Canada but one of the things that's interesting about our nation is that for whatever reasons when we look at ourselves in light of our neighbor to the south the United States and even other countries around the world that have been prosperous Canada is unusually prosperous right now. We have a lot of successful people, a lot of people who are winning their races day in, day out. But one of the interesting things also we discover, particularly on our prayer lines, is that some of the most successful people are some of the most unhappy. They're dissatisfied. That in the quiet moments after the roar of the crowd has stopped and uh, all of the adulation has ceased, there's that sense that there's still something missing. Now, sometimes uh, God will do some dramatic things to get our attention. Now, hopefully, you don't have to have a horrific car crash to get your attention, as happened in this particular story. But often, God will bring some bumps into our lives, some surprises into our lives, to remind us that there's something more important than dying with all the toys, that uh, Jesus himself had to address even in his day. And it was a poor culture, but there were successful people there. And on occasion, he would address successful people. And in Mark chapter 8, one of the interesting scriptures in verses 36 through 37, he's talking about people amassing reputation, amassing success, amassing security. But then he asks this question, but what would it profit you if you were to gain the whole world but lose your everlasting soul? That's a question 
we want to ask you, and we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, that there will be a sense of deep calling to deep, the Holy Spirit speaking to your spirit to say, hey, what about it? He's talking to you right now. He's addressing you. You look like you're on the verge of gaining the whole world. You, you invested in gold stocks uh, uh, two years ago, and you're, you're flying high. You're, you're doing well. Yeah, you've got a good business and a nice home and a couple of cars, and perhaps up there in the Muskoka Lakes, you've got a beautiful cottage. But the bottom line is, you know that while you may be gaining the whole world, you could be losing your soul. Today could be a brand new day where you understand what is worth investing your life in. And that's in a relationship with God, because one day all this stuff is going to rust, decay, and be gone. One day it's not going to be there anymore. We had a fellow up in Timmins. Uh, his name was Mr. Bartleman, very successful man. And often people would say to him, you know, you can't take it with you. And he said, if I can't take it with me, I'm not going. But guess what? <laughs> Mr. Bartleman's gone and he couldn't take it with him. He had to leave it all behind. Where are you? What's your relationship to God right now? Do you understand that he has a new day planned for you? And if you'll give us a call at 877-431-7887 and 416-431-0700, we'd love to talk with you further, pray with you about your eternal destiny, and give you some teaching materials that we believe will help you understand what's worth investing in for tomorrow. 877-431-7887 and 416-431-0700. Give us a call. Well, up next, a crack in a marriage becomes a crater. You start talking to someone, they start talking to you, and then one day I just, you know, decided that I just didn't want to be married to Kevin. I just said, hey, if I'm not a good leader in this house, maybe I can be one someplace else. Chris will be better off without me. Watch how this couple fell in love after their divorce. Well, for years, the Melans' marriage was a revolving door. First she left, then he left, and finally they divorced. But that divorce was just the beginning of this love story. I didn't want to admit that a Christian couple could have the kind of problems that we had. We don't the, have the excessive fighting and strife and yelling and the financial stuff. Nobody had really talked to me about that. I was actually really verbally abusive, um, just a horrible listener. Four years into the marriage, Chris decided to leave Kevin for someone she'd met at work. You start talking to someone, they start talking to you, and Kevin didn't know anything about it. And then one day I just, you know, decided that I just didn't want to be married to Kevin. And I said, I'm moving out, I found an apartment, and I'm taking Brandon with me. The way I processed that was, okay, I'm not good enough for Chris. She doesn't respect me. Something that I deeply desired to have, but I don't know if I even believed I deserved it. Six weeks later, Kevin persuaded Chris to come back home. It was always like, let's get this over with. Let's fix it. You know, I'm a typical guy. Let's, let's if it breaks, let's fix it. I was going to do these things in Kevin's strength to be better. And it didn't work. For the next four years, it was just like a constant collision of wills. Chris and Kevin kept up the facade of a happy marriage, even at their church. And then Kevin met someone else. I just said, hey, if I'm not a good leader in this house, maybe I can be one someplace else. Chris will be better off without me. Brandon doesn't need to be around this all the time. When I see him on the weekends, I'll be a better person. It was all again about making these things happen in my own strength. You know, I didn't ever go to God and, and, and try to seek godly counsel. I had a, we were going to church regularly and my pastor tried to talk to me and I just pushed him away. Kevin told Chris he wanted a divorce. Probably what hit me the hardest is that I knew that it was because I had really failed spiritually. I mean, I knew that I was not at all the kind of wife that I thought that I was, that I was all about works and, and all about like a performance-based type of wife instead of like, what is in my heart towards you? Like, am I really loving you unconditionally? 
And I mean, I think that's the thing that haunted me the most when he left, is I just was faced with like, no, I'm not. Since Chris was a mediator in the court system, she was able to expedite their divorce. It was final one month later. I was working on my house, my dad was there. It was seriously like God tapped me on the shoulder and said, enough, you know better. And I literally reached over to my dad and said, dad, I can't live this way. You know, I know better, you guys taught me better than this. So, I mean, it was in that moment that I, honestly, everything, it was like everything I learned about Christ and his unconditional love for me was just on the surface. Kevin decided to try to make a new start with Chris and went to talk to her. I was so disgusted. I, I just wanted nothing to do with him. He's just like, do, would you be willing to just listen to me? Would you take some time just to hear me out? And I'm like, no. That night, I had to sit in my kitchen alone and go, wow, now I'm alone. That place I hate to be, but God, I have you. And I remember just saying over and over, night after night, if Chris doesn't come around, I have you. Kevin got serious about his relationship with God and began writing letters to Chris. I thought, well, if I can write her letters and communicate the truth that I should have been communicating, you know, the things I loved about her when we got married, those letters were about me owning that stuff. That was about me saying, you know, I, I'm just asking you to forgive me. Then after several weeks, Chris had a change of heart that surprised even her. It was 100% an act of the Holy Spirit, I'm not joking. I mean, a lot of people say, like, God spoke to me or God did this. I didn't, like, hear anything, <laughs> nothing. It wasn't, like, some audible voice or, like, a gong went off or something. But um, I literally feel like my heart was so hardened. I don't know. I, it was just there was, like, an ache inside. Like, what if? What if you don't do this? Kevin and Chris went through intense counseling to learn how to rebuild their relationship. In March of 1999, one year after their divorce, they remarried. Today, Kevin and Chris work together helping other couples through their retreat, Mountain Haven Marriage Ministry. They've learned what it takes for a relationship to be truly successful. The difference between this marriage and the first one is now we have the tools. We know what to do. We know that we have to absolutely lean on Christ. You gotta focus on who you are in Christ before you can focus on a marriage. Just believing in the fact that Christ can change you to be a better spouse, that's gotta be your goal. We receive all kinds of calls on our prayer lines. And just a reminder, those lines are available 24-7-877-431-7887 and 416-431-0700. But one of the areas where we seem to get a large majority of calls is in this area of family relationships, and particularly relationships between husbands and wives. And there are an increasing uh, levels of stress on marriages today. One of the reasons for that is that people get into marriage not really fully understanding that it's not all about them. And in this piece we just saw with the Melans, you know, the, the struggle was, uh, I want this marriage to be about me rather than to be about you. And that's fundamentally the problem we have. When I was pastoring in the city of Toronto out in Weston at the Kingsview Church, one of the things that I did with every couple that I sat down with was to have a, a counseling time with them, several weeks of counseling before I would agree to marry them. And one of the things we talked about was the reality that marriage has to be something that uh, is a give and take. But more significantly, it's more give than take. Now, you're probably reacting to that because you thought marriage was all about take, what it would do for you. But the reason we say that is because Jesus himself gave us an example. He talked about himself as the bridegroom and the church as the bride. And one of the things that we see in this model that Jesus gives for the bridegroom is that Jesus himself lays down his life, gives up everything for his bride, the church. And so one of the things we've discovered as we've worked with people in terms of their marriage relationships is that if they'll understand that in the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and you can't do this unless you have a relationship to God, you've ex received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your life because you can't love unconditionally. You can't give yourself away unless you have the spirit of the one who gave himself away residing in you. So the main answer to a marriage that works begins with this understanding 
that it's not about you but about the opportunity you have to invest in the other. Now, we have some wonderful teaching materials that will help you better understand these core principles of love and marriage. If you'll call us at 877-431-7887 and 416-431-0700 and ask the person who answers the phone, please, may I have the little booklet, Love and Marriage, and we'll get it right out to you. Also, you can go to our website. You can go to www.700club.ca. And you'll see there a little tab that you can click on, and you can then get those materials directly over the Internet. We'd be happy to send them to you. But the bottom line is this. God has ordained marriage and has created it as an opportunity for us to better understand Jesus' love for the church and the church's love for Jesus. And so remember this. It's not about what you get out of it, but what God through the Holy Spirit enables you to give to it that will make your marriage a success. Give us a call if we can help you and pray with you. Well, still ahead, he defied gravity. And I didn't half do it either. And dared God. If you're real, then make yourself known. Find out where this extreme sportsman found the ultimate rush when we return. Glenn Carlson was the ultimate adrenaline junkie, bungee jumping, white water rafting, rock climbing. No sport was too extreme for him. But when the rush wore off, the only thing left was the emptiness of his life. Each year, thrill seekers come from all over the world to West Virginia's New River Gorge to get an adrenaline fix, and they rarely go away disappointed. Whether it's riding the waves of the New River, climbing the endless wall, or even parachuting off the Western Hemisphere's highest bridge, this place appeals to outdoorsmen of every kind. But what most people come to enjoy for a weekend, Glenn Carlson turned into a lifestyle, and it almost consumed him. How extreme is the extreme? And if you keep living through it, then it must not have been quite as extreme as, as the next one can be. Glenn Carlson built his career on adventure, getting paid to do what he loved enjoying the great outdoors. And I didn't half do it either, you know. I mean, I owned a whitewater company. We had a kayak school, a rock climbing school. I traveled the country training, and I was at the top of my game for that game. Glenn was there for more than just the scenery, however. It was all about boating and climbing and winter ice climbing and full bore, white knuckle, extreme. And if you get really good at it, you'll, you'll sort of stand out. So then you sort of get your ego stroked by standing out, and you start to think, well, that's cool. For an adrenaline junkie, everything had to be extreme. And that's where the lifestyle turned into an addiction. Every extreme move has to be taught by another, taught by another, you know. And you just have this whole lifestyle that if it isn't on the up all the time, this just super rush high from the extreme sports to the next trip to the next activity, the next woman, the next party, the next whatever, um, nothing fulfills, nothing sustains. What looked like a great lifestyle wasn't much of a life. And when the adrenaline was gone, it left depression in its wake. You know, you just couldn't leave and, and breathe that every minute of the day. So when you're left sober and not dealing with an extreme day, then what's life all about? I mean, I didn't know. I wanted to be significant and have fulfillment and, and measure it all in the externals. And I remember it very clearly as the despair of how much further can you go? I'm doing this every day for a living and it isn't fulfilling. And, I have this awful, shameful past, and I know it's sinful. Glenn's work schedule was crushing, and his marriage was on the rocks. As things continued to get worse, both at work and at home, Glenn went searching for answers. Mine, very specifically, was a cry out to God of, if you're real, then make yourself known. If all this stuff is real about what your son did and so on and so forth, then show me. The answer to that prayer was closer than he thought. I had a neighbor that clearly shared where his peace came from, but he also was the first one to explain to me that he lived with the Holy Spirit inside him and had a power that was greater than me and could look me in the eye and say, you're always trying to do it on your own. 
why don't you read this? And he challenged me to read the book of John three times. Glenn was still skeptical. And the first time I was just, you know, reading through it. And the second time and the third time, the Lord had a hold of me. And I really feel like I was at the bottom crying out and there was the answer. And here he's saying, you can have life and have it to the full. That's what I've always wanted. This was the first time that I really understood that Christ submitted to his father, the will of his father and unto death. And that really struck a chord with me. I mean, that's extreme living. And I went from being a person crying out to God to truly going, you did it, you bought my way. I can be free of this old sin. I'm yours. That surrender made all the difference. Glenn sold his business, changing his lifestyle and his priorities. The effects of those changes are evident in his life today. Yeah, I can quit running. I can quit being obsessed with getting as much of it as fast as I can, you know, and just an internal peace and a fulfillment and a joy that's just, yeah, I don't have to chase everything so hard with both hands anymore. You know, when I was growing up in northern Canada, I hung up with some guys that just were into extreme sports. I mean, the snowmobiling, the ice fishing, the cross-country skiing, all of that kind of thing was so much a part of our thinking. And going out and living off the land to kind of push the limits. And the reason we do that is we want to test ourselves. We want to see if there's something beyond our own uh, capabilities. We want to push ourselves to the very edge. And, and what happens when we do that is that we release something in us that's quite addictive. It's called adrenaline. It's like a, a body-made drug. And, and the thing about adrenaline is you never can get enough of it. So a lot of the guys I hung out with there in the Timmins Woods would push themselves to the next level, the next level, and the next level. They get crazier and crazier in some of the kinds of things that they would do because the next high had to be higher than the last high. Does that describe you today? I mean, you're, you're just out there looking for the next high. You're looking for rush after rush. You're trying all kinds of things. I don't know what it is. It could be sex, could be drugs, could be all kinds of experiences, but you keep pushing to the next limit, pushing to the next limit. You're almost an individual who isn't afraid of death, but every once in a while you get into something that causes you to think about it, don't you? You wonder, is there life beyond the grave? Is this really smart to be doing? Because I don't know if I do something and if I push it too far, and that's it for me. What lies beyond? We believe that what lies beyond is a loving Heavenly Father if you've experienced the person of Jesus Christ. We have some wonderful testimonies about people who have pushed it to the limit and have seen the promise of life that is more abundant, as John 10.10 says, life and more abundantly. Give us a call at 877-431-7887 and 416-431-0700. There's life abundant for you. Goodbye, we'll see you next time on Canadian Edition. For more information, or if you'd like to help continue the ministry of Canadian Edition, please write to us with your gift today. Our address is CBA, Post Office Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S 4T4. Become a 700 Club partner and write today. Thank you.